I'm going to be talking in this talk about uh, accessibility APIs and uh, their relationship to ARIA. And that's a bit of an odd thing to talk about to a JavaScript group because JavaScript has no access to the accessibility APIs. Uh, it can't bind any event listeners to it. It can't uh, retrieve information from it. So why would I bother talking about it? Well, at work, sometimes a developer will come to me and say, I've added all this area markup to my web app, and uh, the screen reader is not presenting it correctly. What am I doing wrong? And I will say, what does the accessibility API layer tell you? And I'll get a blank stare. Uh, at which point, I'll fire up some accessibility inspector and looking at what their markup is actually doing, and that proves to be quite informative. Uh, and sometimes we can fix the problem. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes it is the screen reader that is the problem. The, the accessibility information is all there, just waiting to be used, and the screen reader just isn't doing it. Um, so, in uh, conclusion of this slide, uh, accessibility APIs are a good thing to know about. One more tool to keep in your back pocket while you're developing your accessible applications and using ARIA to do so. And I'll go quickly through this presentation and say something about what a accessibility APIs are, how they came to be, what they are for, and how ARIA fits into that picture. Uh, and hopefully convince you that paying attention to what's going on at the Accessibility API layer is a good thing for you to do. The Accessibility API contains semantic information about what is running on the user's desktop. Uh, that is sometimes abbreviated AAPI, sometimes you'll hear people say Alley API. Uh, it's the job of the various applications running on the desktop to publish this accessibility information out to the accessibility layer, and it's the jobs of assistive technologies to consult with that layer and relay the information to the user. And I'll try and illustrate this in the next few slides. This is a picture of someone's desktop. They're running an application on it. Uh, the user has uh, got into the pop uh, bottle uh, got into the menu bar, popped open the edit menu, and scrolled down to the copy menu item and was about to uh, choose it, select it. Uh, at the same time, they're possibly an assistive technology user. They might be using an on-screen keyboard, they might be using a screen reader, they might be using voice control, they might be using a screen magnifier, or they might be using a combination of all those things. And that assistive technology has to say something about what's going on on the left here with that edit menu. And this is where accessibility APIs enter the picture. As I said, the application is required to publish information out to the accessibility API. And the, uh, so the technology can then uh, consult it uh, and present the information to the user. Uh, the AT can also push back into the accessibility API and say, I need this to happen. In this case, perhaps select the copy menu item. And the accessibility API relays that information back to the application, and the copy menu item is selected and executed. I'll we'll give a little more detail what's in that middle vertical box called Alley API. Uh, there is a tree data structure in there that consists of accessible objects. Uh, so you have an accessible object containing other accessible objects, possibly leaf accessible objects. Each accessible has at least a role. Um, going back to the previous slide, it would be a menu item role for the thing that was highlighted. It has a name, in the case of the last example, copy. It may or may not have a description. Uh, description is optional. You can think of the description as a tooltip, a short description of what that thing might be. 
uh, it has various states of properties. Things like it's enabled, it's focusable, it currently has keyboard focus, it's selectable, it could be checked, and so on. There are a lot of possible states of properties. Accessibility API also has an event model. Uh, it can fire events that the accessibility technology can't, be pardon me, the assistive technology can link into and respond to. So if there's a focus change event, for example, the accessibility API can fire that event out to the AT and it can react. Uh, some of the events in at the accessibility, accessibility API layer are simply OS or GUI uh, toolkit events just pass through. Some are specific to the accessibility API. So the accessibility API ends up informing the AT what is about to go on and what is going on. A little history about accessibility APIs. They were developed back in ancient times, back in the 80s and mid to late 90s. Uh, the first ones, uh, there's MSAA. Uh, one thing I want to point out, there isn't a single accessibility API out there. Uh, I think this is a little bit of unfortunate past history. With the DOM, you have a DOM. There is one DOM. With accessibility APIs, you have at least four or five, and they're all operating system specific. So Windows has MSAA, Microsoft Active Accessibility. Uh, shortly thereafter, IBM uh, and a couple of others got together and extended MSAA and came up with iAccessible 2 or IE2. On uh, Linux, no, you have ATK slash ATSPI. ATK is an accessibility toolkit. ATSPI is the Assistive Technology Service Provider Interface. Um, more recently, Microsoft has revamped its accessibility API. It's come up with a second generation called User Interface Automation, UIA. Uh, and Apple has joined the fray, and they have AX API. Uh, but anyhow, back to the mid-80s, or the 80s and the mid to late 90s. The effort then was to develop this accessibility technology uh, for the desktop, to make desktop GUI applications accessible. And back then, the web was young. I, I really like that last horse and buggy picture, Jerry. So-called Web 1.0. Back then, you could use the same technique that was used for desktop GUI applications with the web, because web documents were primarily document-oriented. There were headers and paragraphs and a few images. If there was any interactivity, it was limited to links and form controls. And the form controls themselves were actual native form controls. If you put a checkbox form control on Windows, it would come up as a Windows checkbox. On a Mac, it would come up as a Mac checkbox. And because the accessibility APIs had already been developed for GUIs, those native widgets automatically became accessible. So, uh, this scheme worked back then with web documents. Uh, you could sort of treat the web documents the same way you would treat a word processor. And as I said, form elements were expressed as native controls. So you get something like this. The application on this desktop is a browser. Uh, you have a markup there, an editor, level one. Uh, a paragraph, a link, those are all published as su such, and the ATs are fairly good at describing things. And this worked okay for a while, and then the world changed, and along came Web 2.0, and dynamic HTML, whereupon you could use CSS and JavaScript to mimic desktop applications. Build full blown tree controls and tab lists and so on out of divs and spans and apply the correct CSS to make it look right and apply the right event handlers and the JavaScript code to make it behave the right way. Uh, this was done, and it's a good thing to extend the interactivity of the web. Uh, but document web, web documents are no longer just documents with a few controls. 
highly interactive, so-called rich internet applications, and the web becomes the platform for them. Uh, the accessibility APIs are still there. They're still published, and, and the browsers are still publishing uh, things up to them. But the HTML presents the problem. And the problem is, is that the dynamic HTML is not exposed in the accessibility API as intended or in a use, useful way. It's still being exposed in a document-like format. So when you look at the actual DOM, the markup, it suffers from divitis. Some people say there are lots of divs and nested spans and spaghetti. But when you look at it rendered on screen, visually, it looks like a desktop GUI or a desktop GUI. It looks fine. And when you interact with it, it behaves like a desktop GUI. But with the accessibility layer, it looks like spaghetti. And what the problem then becomes is the need to expose that information as the author intended. Don't expose the HTML as given. Expose it the way the author intended. So how do you do that? I'm going to try and switch out an example. Oh. So, uh, I need to interact with this. At the top, I have it right here. Is that true? Yeah, this is not a checkbox. I'll click it. And it checks. I'll take uh, half the space bar and it unchecked. Is that a checkbox? Well, the actual markup is an H1. In fact, it's got two images there. Uh, when it first comes up, it's the unchecked.gif. There's JavaScript there and styling, so that when you click on it, it looks and acts like a checkbox. Uh, and I'm going to put it in my hand. This is one of the accessibility API inspector tools on the we're inspecting that page that I just showed. And on the left is the, is the accessibility tree. And on the right, you can get more information about different nodes. So I'll go down to that heading tag, indeed in H level one. And I'll go down to the accessible object. No, not the accessible object, the accessible properties thing. And yes, it's a heading. It's a role is heading. It is focusable. It's enabled. But what's being told through the accessibility API to the ATs is that this is a heading. Even though for the sighted user, it's a perfectly normal checkbox and behaves like a checkbox and looks like a checkbox. How do we fix this? It's a checkbox. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly the same markup. It behaves like a checkbox. I can click on it, but <clears throat> if I go back, it's here. It's a checkbox whose name is this is an area checkbox. It's focusable and so on. Uh, in fact, this will say focused if I put focus on it and refresh the display. And how did that come about? The set has got exactly the same markup except it had, had some area added to it. Um, it has had a role equals checkbox added. Uh, an area check state starts off as false. You set the JavaScript up so that when it gets checked, you, the JavaScript switches the value of every check to true. Uh, and the image of the uh, 
check box, has a role of presentation. Presentation is this way of saying this piece of markup is not really semantically relevant. It has no meaning. So it's not going to show up in the accessibility tree at all. And actually, I should go back and show that. Heading accessible inside it, it has a graphic, which is that checkbox picture, GIF. If you go inside the check button, there's no graphic. It doesn't show up at this layer. And just to drive the point home, I'm going to try this with a screen reader.
going to talk a little bit more about the area and its nature. I like to think of it as unobtrusive. And I may be using the word unobtrusive in a non-standard way here. Uh, what I mean by that uh, is that it doesn't change what the browser does with the markup. And if you take some markup and you want it to be a button, say, and you put an area roll of button on it, it won't suddenly become focusable or react to clicks or do anything. It will still look the same way it did before. Uh, this is important because sometimes people come to the IDRC and say, we need help making our web pages and our web applications accessible. What can we do to do that? Uh, and we look at it and we make recommendations and sometimes we recommend, well, you need to add some area here and there. Uh, and their shoulders slope. And they go, oh, we have to throw all our code out and be assigned this from the beginning. We say, no, not necessarily. You might have to tweak it a bit. But if you've got good markup and you've got well-designed widgets, then it should be, to a first approximation, it should be a matter of just placing the right area attributes in at the right places, and it should work. It won't be that easy, but it won't be a matter of throwing everything away and starting from scratch. Uh, because there is not going to change what your application is doing. It's just going to be a layer of proper information of the accessibility API. Uh, another way of putting this is that area is sort of after the fact. A uh, developer has gone to the length of making some markup behave in a goofy widget kind of way. Uh, and then, after they're done and it's working, they then add the area after the fact, and that adds the accessibility information in the Some people like to say that area is just annotations. They're just literally little notes in your markup. And I like to say area doesn't do anything. It doesn't change the way the browser renders or makes the web page behave. And I'll point back to the checkbox example I gave. Both header, both, both of the two examples I gave, they both behaved and looked exactly the same way, regardless of whether area was there or not. Area didn't change anything. Now, area does do something. It publishes information to the accessibility. I will note, however, that uh, you can link area attributes to styling. And this might be very useful. So if, you, if, you're, if you're using area checks uh, to say whether a checkbox is checked or not, you can apply this style rule to perhaps put an image of a checkbox, checked or unchecked, as the case may be. And then all your JavaScript has to do is update, <coughs> excuse me, update the uh, state of the of our area checks, and it will display in the proper way. But if you do that, you negate half the lines in your previous slide. Because then it is actually impacting you. Yes, but it's not directly impacting you. This, this is huge. The scripting. We spend so much time in, in jQuery changing class names and applying styles to the visual appearance. appearance. This allows you to focus on semantics and attributes and values yep. and let CSS and the browser do all that heavy lifting. That's right. Um, and one line, final note. Uh, I often get people telling me that uh, area is just for HTML and it isn't. It's, it's language neutral. Its first target is HTML, but work has already begun to use exactly the same area attributes as SVG to make SVG accessible. It doesn't care what the markup is. It's trying to describe what the markup does. Uh, and during the development of, of uh, ARIA, Mozilla was incorporating it along the way into Zool. I don't know if people know what Zool is. It's the 
XML user interface language. It's what Firefox uses to define its own menus and toolbars and its Chrome around the edges. So there's area already in there. Ah, this unobtrusiveness does lead to a couple of interesting little gotchas. Uh, conflicts with host semantics. Uh, by and large, there are really two main parts to area. There are the role attribute and then the, the states and properties attribute. If you put an area role on something, that area role wins as far as the accessibility of the eye is concerned. So again, I have sort of the H1 example here for the role of checkbox. That role of checkbox throws away the, the given or standard role of H1. H1 is masked. And that will always be the case. That leads to a potential problem. If you have an honest to God HTML button and you give it a role of heading, then the browser will happily push out to the accessibility layer that that's a heading. But because ARIA is unobtrusive, you actually have a button rendered on the document, on the screen, and it acts like a button, and you push it to behave like a button. Uh, we warn people, don't repurpose buttons this way. <laughs> because it leads to a very odd situation. Uh, however, there are some crazy ninja JavaScript programmers out there who will go to great lengths to turn that button to style that button so it looks like a heading and add code so that it doesn't behave like a button at all anymore. <laughs> and in that case, then putting a roll of heading on there makes sense. <laughs> but I would tell them, do yourself a favor and just do the heading tag. <laughs> <laughs> it's much simpler. So, if you assign a role to each one, the entire page obeys that rule. Any H one is no, just um, just the just that just that one. Yeah, yeah. areas local. You just add it to the elements as you need to. Uh, second rule about area states and properties: uh, if you have a conflict with a state and property, area loses. The native semantic. So I have an example here uh, of an input type checkbox with a checked attribute. Uh, and every check equals false. The browser will publish that as a checked, true, proven check checkbox. It will ignore the error check. Uh, that means as of today, the only way you can make a tri-state checkbox is to use area and use it on an element that doesn't have a check state. Native check state. Does everyone know what a tri state checkbox is? Okay. Uh, suppose you have a form for ordering pizza and you have a list of ingredients for the pizza mozzarella, mushrooms, hot peppers, and a checkbox at the top that's sort of the overall checkbox that says include everything. If you click that checkbox, all the other checkboxes. If you then uncheck a couple of the other checkboxes, the main one gets turned to a dash, meaning it's partially checked. That's what the try state means. True, false, and mixed. And uh, the area checked state allows for all three. Uh, as far as I know, HTML5 checkboxes are still just true or false. They should fix that. Okay, uh, that sort of concludes my uh, discussion of accessibility APIs. I'm going to do a very, very quick, brief overview of Eric itself. Um, the reason is that it's going to be brief is because if I start actually doing it, uh, there's a lot of information in the area spec, and I could talk for days. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a taste. As I said earlier, uh, the major division is between roles and states and properties. Uh, the roles come in a few flavors. Uh, uh, the role
roles themselves uh, are built, the taxonomy of roles is kind of like a class hierarchy. So they are base roles out of which there are uh, sub roles and sub roles and sub roles. So at the very top is these few roles that are called abstract. And the whole reason for doing that is so you can associate states and properties with them so that the sub roles can just automatically inherit them. Uh, so, a couple of the abstract ones are command, landmark, and range. <clears throat> so, an example of a, of a real command role is a button. Button derived command. I think many of you those two. Uh, range is sort of the base class for spinners and sliders. Uh, so I put in there, don't use abstract rules because the browsers will not publish those to the accessibility API. Use, use the ones that follow through. So there's a set of widget roles, which is mostly what I've been talking about. So there's buttons, checkboxes, menu bars, dialogues, there's a tree, there's tab lists. Uh, there's dialogues, there's alert dialogues. It's pretty much trying to mimic everything you can find on the desktop, really. <coughs> there's also some document roles, things like articles, note, directory. Directories just really means table of contents. The purpose of these roles is so you can make sense out of the section, or give more specific specificity to, to the sections of your document. So you have a group of paragraphs that actually constitute some article in say a wiki page, then you can say that's an article rather than just a set of paragraphs. Or a couple of paragraphs over here, which are sort of an aside, you can say, well, that's a note. And that will be communicated to the accessibility layer and the AT can then provide a richer description of the page. Again, it's trying to focus in on what the author's intent is. Uh, landmark roles, main search navigation application. Uh, this is very useful for navigation of the page. Uh, you can then you can then look at your page and say, well, this is the main part of the body of the page. And all this other stuff and sort of other things you want to allow, sort of branding perhaps. So if a AT user wants to quickly get to the main section of the page, they can, you know, what ATs do is uh, provide on command a list of the landmarks, and then the user can say, I want to go to the main part of the page, and then immediately take it there. Or I want to go to, <coughs> go to the search field, and then immediately take it there. Landmarks are good for very quick navigation. And then there's a section on live regions. Uh, those are the five roles that are considered live regions. <laughs> See, I got one. <laughs> All right, I'll try. Thank you. Uh, live regions are areas of the chain of the page that they're dynamically updating due to the system. Classic example is a chat log. So you may have a web-based chat application, and so if the chats come in, that region is updating. Um, by doing this, by marking the, the areas as live regions, again, at the accessibility API layer, an AT can be, receive notifications that this has changed, and I should tell the user that this has changed. <clears throat> States and properties uh, are all begin with area dash. Uh, they're not so neatly classified as the roles are. They, they, there are classifications of them, but the same area <clears throat> attribute, area dash attribute, ends up in multiple classifications. So I'll go through and sort of point that out. The main one is the difference between global attributes and non-global. In the global case, you don't need a role. 
we can apply them to any element. So area label, area described by, area flow to, and area columns are examples of those. Anything can have a label as far as area is concerned. Not just form elements. Uh, the label tag in HTML is technically confined to form controls. Uh, area flow to, you can use that for if you've got something like a wizard and this page flows to this page. So you use the area flow to sort of pre-alert the assistive technology where you might go next. Uh, area owns is for, uh, there are some cases where you might want to have a, a parent-child relationship that you can't realize using the dot itself. A classic example is you have a pop-up menu. That pop-up menu can appear in multiple locations on the page. You can have multiple parents. So you define it once, and what its parent becomes is, is, is where it appears the next time it appears. So in the DOM, it might be a child of something, but as the web page is used and the user makes a gesture to make that pop-up come up somewhere, then you can say, area owns this pop-up at this point in time, and that element becomes the parent of the pop-up. We caution people to not abuse area elements. If you can make the parent-child relationship using DOM, then do that. There are a set of non-global attributes. Those ones that require a role. An area check is an example. You can only have area check on option, checkbox, menu item checkbox, radio, menu item radio, and tree item. Nothing else can be checked. That's the restriction. And the value for area check, as I said before, is true, false, and mixed. There's a whole set of widget roles. So these are, uh, pardon me, widget states and properties. Uh, area label is one of them, and it's global. So here's an example of how states and properties cross classify. Uh, area has pop up is another. Area has pop up is, is to declare that this element will pop up a menu if you activate it. So, from a visual point of view, you, you usually do that with a little down pointing triangle. That's the visual cue that there's a pop up here. That's a nice visual cue, but it doesn't show up in the accessibility API. By putting area pop up there, you provide the semantic information that can be related to the existing. Now the user, if there's a pop-up here, you could activate. Area check is also a, a, widget, a widget state. There are also relationship uh, properties. I've already spoken a little about area owns, but there's another set called area pause and set, area set size. Those are combined to list item, tree item, and option. Uh, if you have a list, area pause and set will declare where in the list that list item occurs. And area set size will say how big the set is. <coughs> and this can be very useful if you have a dynamically loading list or tree, or you're connected to a database and you're only pulling in, say, five items at once. And so you're only showing items 20 to 25 out of 300. Set size will be 300, and the pause and set will go 20, 25, and so the AT can tell the user, you're at this location properly in the list, even though only part of it is actually displayed. Live region, yes. There's area live, area busy, area atomic, and area relevant. They're all global. Area live is kind of neat. The very presence of area live attribute on an element tells you it's a live region. The value of the area live attribute tells you how polite it is. If area live equals off, the updates are only reported if the users put focus on the area live region. If 
sorry, uh, live is polite. Uh, it won't interrupt the current speech if you're in a screen reader scenario. It'll wait till the end of the sentence or something. Trying to do it gracefully, unlike me. And uh, area uh, assertive for area live <coughs> means immediately interrupt whatever is being said and report it. There are two drag and drop. Yes? So, uh, then we have audio uh, visible uh, equals true or false. Are they? And then if we set that attribute, uh, does audio live or go to that as well? Or? Say it again. For, uh, for example, if there is a paragraph uh, that is visible or invisible based on some, based on some event. Right. So uh, I'm setting area, area visible equals true or false based on the event. Okay. So area live will report that as well uh, to AT or how does it work? Yeah, you have to actually sit down and look at the example and see how the two interact. Oh. <laughs> actually, for no. The way it works at the moment in most screen readers is that they'll only update when text inside the region actually changes, not when it's simply hidden or not hidden, uh, even if the user Thank you. Whether that's the, the spec design or not. Mm -hmm. Usually you have to empty out the text inside the container and then yeah. inject the text back into the container, then it'll speak. What is the use of audio visible the use of area uh, is true or false is, well, first of all, if you have a screen reader that will not honor, um, for example, uh, styles used to hide something, uh, for example, a screen reader might only look at the DOM, yes. not look at uh, display non styles and CSS, and it will still read it. Such a screen reader could use area hidden to actually realize from the DOM, okay, this content is supposed to be invisible. But more realistically, um, you can use it to high content that you don't want uh, screen media users to accidentally navigate to. Uh, for example, if you open the dialog, you don't want a user to be able to use virtual navigation to the background of the, of the page, because if it's a model dialog, that content is supposed to be disabled. But for example, in JAWS, you can open up a links list or a headings list where you can just virtually navigate outside of the dialog. Um, area hidden can be used in that case to actually hide that content any scenario where you want something to be hidden from the screen reader. In particular, um, a case where um, you're also hiding it up with CSS, but also, uh, and that's what I find more useful, cases where content is actually visibly there still, but for example, it's straight out or something visually. Uh, that's kind of a long answer. And just a bit more, just simply making something visible, even if you had already a hidden a false, doesn't cause it to be read immediately. It would only be read if the screen reader got to it. You would have to, if you want it to be read right now, you'll need to do some sort of writing in addition to just making it visible. That makes sense. I wasn't sure if that was in your question, but I wanted to clarify that. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. The things that you want to drag are marked with area grabbed. Very grabbed equals true. Uh, when you get them over a drop target, uh, the drop target has an area drop effect uh, attribute that says what can happen there. Currently, it's copy, move, make a shortcut, execute, or provide a pop up of possible actions. That's a quick overview of area roles, states, and properties. Uh, area is for the accessibility API. It is added to the DHML to allow browsers to publish accurate information about the web page so that ATs can present it as such. There's a list of roles for various inspectors for looking at the accessibility API. As I said at the beginning, that was an 
important tool to keep in mind. There's a DOM inspector that works for Firefox. Uh, the nice thing about that is you can run on a Mac or on Windows or on Linux and see what the accessibility API is. The downside is it only shows you what Firefox is going to publish. It doesn't show you what Safari is going to publish or Chrome. Uh, on Windows, there's Act Pro. Um, it will show you MSAA and IA2. Uh, it will work with Firefox and IE. On the home, there's Actorizer. Uh, it will work with any browser that runs on the home. Uh, on the Mac, there's the Accessibility Inspector, uh, which will work, I think, with, well, definitely works with Safari, and I think it will work with Chrome as well. I'm not sure about Firefox. And the Apache Alpha Group has a viewer. That's one of the it might be the only one that does user interface automation. For the area spec itself, there's the main specification document. There's something called the Author and Practices Guide. That gives you hints on how to use our uh, It also has a section on design patterns to show you what keyboard uh, keystrokes to use for different very widgets. <coughs> if the user agent implementation guide, uh, that's mostly for browsers. That tells browsers how they're supposed to take the area information and map it from the APIs. It's also useful for AT vendors because they're the ones consulting accessibility APIs. And it's a document also for authors called Using Wayne Area in HTML. Thank goodness I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is a rich topic for questions, so please feel free to ask. And there, there are many people in the room that could respond. So go ahead. Go ahead. So how awesome would it be if IAs and designers actually annotated their deliverables with ARIA roles before it came to development? That would be awesome. awesome. <laughs> Are you guys pushing that on that community somehow? Or like suggesting that or training or kind of stuff like this is what's getting that. Yeah, this is the, this is the platform for that. Yeah. Okay. Even better would be just good native semantics to start with. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And then well, we can go from there. So. But taxonomy can help you force that and give you a framework to work in. Well, that would, that would lead up into my next question, which is when you have a, have a hard time getting developers to use native semantics, how do you get them to use ARIA? Yeah. And is it a good idea to even be pushing ARIA if you can't even get native semantics working correctly? Well, I guess it depends on whether the native semantics will work. <laughs> they don't have to go to ARIA. So, I'm, I'm a newbie, so I'm a little foggy. Point. Um, I was wondering, it, just, it sounds pretty daunting that uh, you know, ARIA and markup could be very uh, granular. And when I'm generating an HTML page, I might, I might end up doing you know, a very granular area markup. So I was just wondering if there's any burden that we can shift to the browser side. If I'm, Using very clean HTML markup, can I stop worrying about hurry? Yes, and like I know. If I'm using a button just as a button. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to say where it has been pushed is the toolkit, like Dojo and jQuery. Uh -huh. Also, they are, HTML5 does a lot of things that Area does, and yeah. will do it built in with the browser. The browser will take care of all the states and keywords. You put five people's date on HTML5 and the date picker built into VoiceOver on iOS is accessible for you. So you don't have to worry about making it accessible to your picker for iPhone. Uh, we'll work like that one day. Um, but at the moment, the uh, HTML5 support of denier and HTML5 spec in accessible ways and narratives. So there is a need to do the same thing. And like just said, libraries. Yeah, if you use them out of the box, 
actually get out of for free. Uh, I will say, um, part of the reason you, you have to do that is because, or part of the reason the browser can't do that, without HTML5, there's not enough semantics in the markup and the deals in the span for the browser to figure out what's going on. So you have to know. <coughs> Um, uh, in modern web, you have um, like lots of custom user interface elements, and they always have a selected state. Visually, you can tell it's selected, and you have an aria selected property, but you can only use it on certain roles. And I know um, other people have proposed making that a global property, so you could put aria selected on anything. I was wondering, uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, in like a lot of times I see R S like and I want to put it everywhere. Yeah. Like, oh that would make things so much easier for us to Yeah, I sometimes wonder if if there's any real value to restricting these area strikes environments to specific roles and why not make them all cool. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> being told that you have a list bar, then you know of the standards are selectable. You know, a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of affordances are known about that object then. If you didn't have that restriction, then you'd say, well, you can do anything. So there's both sides of the question. So how does the ARIA markup get translated to a screen reader when the language is only uh -huh. What you have to do then, uh, I don't know if it's done on the server side or done in the script on the client. If the, okay. You said the language attribute in the, on the HTML element uh, and will automatically do that. If the screen is supposed to have language, it will automatically do that in space of using that language. Gotcha. I was going to say, you, you, instead of for an area label, Instead of putting an actual string in there, you put a symbol. And depending on, I guess, I guess, say a server side model, and it knows it's pushing it out to the Japanese the client, then it replaces that with the Japanese string. It's a standard localization issue. But uh, things like roles, like saying it's only in a slider, like what's a slider in Japanese, or they pick it up in Spanish, right, or true. what's the instruction for you to be able to use that's up to the screen reader yes. so actually to having those strings or, or yeah. trans uh, translated into the language that the screen reader was downloaded in the first instance. In actual fact, in most cases in the accessibility API layer, roles are just numbers. And, and that number means something. So there has to be some piece of software that translates that. Do you happen to know the major like uh, web content management system vendors? Are the uh, I don't know who works with this. Drupal and WordPress, or the commercial ones. The commercial ones don't put as much accessibility in unless it's like IBM or something. Um, but WordPress and Drupal are you know, putting on it. And since they're open source, they evolve over time, and keep getting more accessibility. Have you ever seen um, ARIA drop effect keys, drag and drop with ARIA that ever used in the real world? Um, I don't know about the real world. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's an example of it. Uh, John Gunderson did one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, actually, the, examples, but the Fluid Project is It's more sketchy. Yeah. So it's a bit difficult to get into the world. Yeah, on the area side, all you're doing is setting the attributes. That's fairly easy. It's actually writing reasonable code that does drag and drop and does the right thing. Looks good. Is intuitive. That's the tricky part. <laughs> writing the JavaScript and actually yeah. drag it yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah.
Any other questions from the group? Yes, what about Orca? You showed that screen reader yep. that we care about elders. Maybe there's a special screen reader. Yeah. Only reason I chose Orca is because I'm a part-time home developer. And I work with an only system. I'm sort of more familiar with that one. Any other last questions before we take our break? Alright, let's give them a, a